What's up, guys? This is Chris. I'm trying out a new recording setup. Uh, don't think I've you know, got it completely figured out yet, but I figured the best way is just to try it out. So we'll see how it goes. Um, in this video, I'm going to be looking at how you apply BERT to languages besides just English. So I had a couple of people ask me uh, about this early on. I think one person asked about, you know, can you, can you show how to use BERT for Arabic? Another person asked about Indonesian. And, you know, my initial reaction to that is like, well, that doesn't sound that interesting because I'm sure that the answer is just that you go out and you find a, uh, you know, a version of BERT that's been pre-trained by someone on the, the language that you're interested in. Uh, turns out it's not that simple. <laughs> um, Basically, you know, that, that model may not exist. Um, kind of, yeah, come to expect that like this stuff is just out there and available, but reality is not, not quite. And even if it does exist, it may not be as, you know, nearly as good, as magical as English BERT is. So it may not deliver the, the performance that you kind of expect out of BERT. Um, so this, this approach is called a monolingual model. So we'll start by, by looking at that, how you take that approach and kind of, you know, what are the issues with it? Why, why isn't that just the obvious answer to this, this problem? So because of those problems, researchers have come up with this other approach called a multilingual model. And when I first heard about that, again, you know, I kind of misunderstood. I thought like, oh, multilingual model, that probably just means like applying BERT to languages besides English. Uh, yeah, wrong again. <laughs> it's more specific than that. Uh, and it's actually something that's, you know, it's, it's really crazy. It's, it's amazing that this works. So instead of just pre-training BERT on English text, we pre-train it on uh, text from like a hundred different languages. Like as, basically as many languages as we can get a substantial amount of text for. And we just, we feed it all into BERT um, as if it were all English, you know, we don't like, we don't differentiate between the languages. It's, it's just like, it's as if we all spoke a single language that just happens to have a very large character set and a very large vocabulary and, you know, a lot of different ways of saying the same thing. <laughs> so we'll look at what a multilingual model is. Um, and then what a multilingual model allows you to do is something that's maybe even more crazy, this concept of cross-lingual transfer learning. So what we're going to do in, in the example code is we'll, we'll take a, uh, a multilingual model and we'll train it to do a particular task using English training data. So, you know, yeah, we'll train it to do it in English. And then we're going to take that model and we're going to apply it to Arabic without actually like training it on Arabic text for that task. And we're going to see that it actually does really well. So pretty, pretty crazy concept. Um, yeah, so I'll talk through mon monolingual models, multilingual models, and then I've got an example uh, notebook to share where we're going to look at the task of um, natural language inferencing. It happens to be kind of a convenient task for studying this uh, language issue. And we'll, we'll apply, uh, we're going we're gonna to use Arabic as our example language. Um, I did find a monolingual model for Arabic, so we'll, we'll try that as well as the cross-lingual transfer technique. And we'll get to see kind of, you know, how those stack up against each other. So why aren't monolingual models the, the easy solution? Well, first of all, you know, remember that kind of a, a key idea in deep learning is that uh, if you've got more training data and a larger model, then, you know, you can do amazing things. And this, uh, this bar plot up here is taken from the, um, the paper for the multilingual model that we'll be looking at. And it's just showing um, how much text they were able to gather for each of these hundred different languages. And the languages are represented by kind of like a, a two character code. And the, uh, the orange bar is you know, what they were able to get from Wikipedia. And then the blue is, is what they were able to add on top of that from common crawl data. Um, and then the scale is logarithmic, so uh, you know the, the variation here is much larger than it than it may look like at first. Um, I pulled out just a few example languages here. So from their bar plot, you know they had a more similar amount of, of English and Indonesian data. Maybe there's like twice as much English, but then um, ten times as much English than Arabic, and you know similar for Turkish. And then it goes down, you know, substantially on some of those uh, some of those other languages further down the plot. 
So essentially, you know, there's, there's this huge variance in the amount of text available in different languages. And that just puts other languages at a disadvantage compared to English when you're, when you're training a deep neural network like BERT. Um, and then, of course, you know, the other aspect of the, the resource problem is, is the financial one. It's, it's really expensive, um, both in terms of hardware and engineering effort, to pre-train a BERT model. Um, and there's a lot of different languages. So, you know, that's not an insurmountable, insurmountable problem, but uh, it certainly helps motivate this multilingual model concept um, over the monolingual one. I wouldn't take this, especially towards the top, I wouldn't take this as a ranking of the popularity of different languages on the internet, because it's they, they gathered this text data in an automated way, so it's really about how much data they were able to gather. Uh, there's an interesting data set that I came across while I was working on this. Um, it's called OSCAR. It's a huge multilingual corpus obtained by language classification and filtering, so again, it's an you know, automated way uh, of the common crawl corpus. And then they've got this table down below where you can see all the languages. I think they have like 160 or so. And they show the um, number of words they were able to take from Common Crawl, the size of the file, and then they did some deduplication um, and share that as well. Uh, and then I put all those, I put that table into a um, spreadsheet so I could sort it. So. In their data set, in Oscar, you know, it's a different ranking. So I think um, for the the previous bar plot, you know, it showed English and Indonesian. Indonesian is second, but um, for Oscar, Russian is the next one, and I think that's probably a more realistic ranking. But yeah, worth checking out if you're you know if you're interested in um, uh, in this topic and need a lot of text from a specific language that you could do unsupervised learning with. Okay, so there are a couple ways in which we can try to use uh, existing machine translation models to help with the language problem. And I am going to focus in this video on the topic of multilingual models, but I thought I'd at least mention a couple translation techniques so, you, so that you're aware of them. Um, the first is that you could use a translation model to translate the application text in your language into English and then use English BERT. So we could take some Arabic text, feed it through a translation model, get some uh, English text out of that, and then we can just feed it into English BERT with uh, you know whatever our application is, classification maybe. Another way that you can use translation to help that I think is, is really cool is to use it to augment your training data. So let's say you're doing something like, you know, you're trying to classify uh, user written comments you're trying to find the ones that are toxic, right? Like insulting or hate speech, things like that. So maybe you've got this small data set of uh, real text written by users uh, that's labeled in Arabic. But then there's also this giant English data set out there, right? There's the Wikipedia Toxic Comments Challenge data set, and it's got a ton of labeled data. So you can take that data set and feed it through a translation model and now you've got this giant labeled uh, Arabic data set that you can use to augment your, your training process. So you'd feed in both the translated text as well as the real text into your uh, model when you, when you fine tune it for your application. And in the benchmark that we're gonna be looking at in the example code, uh, they actually provide translated versions of the training text. It definitely improves the performance of your model if you, if you kind of augment your training with that data. So maybe the limitation here is that, you know, maybe there's not a, a large labeled English data set for, for your application. But if there is one, then this is a great technique. Now let's talk about the approach that's the, you know, actual focus of this video, which is multilingual models. And I think the explanation that I gave in the introduction, you know, pretty well covers it. Basically, the, the original BERT was trained on English Wikipedia, um, as well as uh, this data set called Book Corpus that was a, um, uh, a collection of self-published books scraped off the web. So with a multilingual model, really the only difference is that we, instead of just training on English, we give it, you know, text from every language. And again, we don't do anything, you know, to, to explicitly tell BERT what language we're giving it. We just feed it all in. 
So the first multilingual model was actually released by the, um, the original BERT authors. Uh, about a month after they, they published and shared um, English BERT, they kind of just you know, tucked, tucked away in the re repository is a, a, a readme for the multilingual model, and they kind of explain what they did. They trained it on Wikipedia and different languages. Um, so that one's referred to as MBERT, lowercase MBERT. And then in November 2019, um, Facebook released XLM Roberta. So if you're familiar with Roberta, that was a uh, sort of a, a variant of BERT that Facebook released where they didn't really change the architecture so much. It was more that they, they experimented with the, um, the pre-training procedure. And so they were able to, to make some changes to that and produce a version of BERT basically that you know, outperformed the original at larger model sizes. So XLM stands for um, cross-lingual model. And all it is is it's, you know, it's, it's MBERT again, but with the kind of the, the changes, the tweaks from Roberta applied to the training process. Also, they, they did add, um, they changed the, the training set. So whereas MBERT was trained on uh, just Wikipedia, we saw in that plot that they also added um, data from Common Crawl.